Hello and welcome everyone to the February 27th edition of eTalking. This is one of the Australia series of course and we're coming back full strength now and we'll be doing some sessions for you during the year, all voluntary, all free and always on topic and on time. E-talking webinar tonight uh, features Chris Winter from West One in Perth, WA. I'm very glad to have Chris with us tonight and he will be doing most of the talking. If there's anyone who's brand new to Blackboard Collaborate, could you put a put your hand up just using the little hand icon, which is third on the participants pod. I can run through a few things for you if necessary. Most of us know the um, the way to, to use things here, the talk button to talk to us, the ch text chat to send messages and of course we'll see the slides on the right hand side. I wanted to um, get Chris to come back tonight and talk more about augmented reality. Ever since I heard Chris speak at one of our national webinars for the projects that are being funded for this year and I was absolutely enthralled with the whole notion of augmented reality. Anne and I had a brief discussion and we realised that according to the Horizon report it is now on the list of things that are going to trend for education in the two to three year time bracket. If you're not sure what we're talking about in the way of a Horizon report, you can go and get your own copy of it. I've put in a link there, it's a live one on the whiteboard to a PDF document that gives you a short list of all those things that are trending in the one year, two to three years and five years time. So give me a, a, a smiley face if you're all familiar with the Horizon report or if you're going to go and get it now and I'll just pause for a moment. Excellent. In the Horizon report it gives a bit of definition of uh, augmented re reality which is probably a little bit small for us to read there but it gives us a bit of an introduction to tonight's session for you and I was really intrigued with this whole idea of how it's going to impact on us educators in this statement here so that it has a strong potential to provide a powerful contextual in-situ learning experience and serendipitous exploration as well as the discovery of the connected nature of information in the real world. Now I'm not stealing your thunder because I know you're going to explain all of that Chris but I thought that this might just intrigue us enough to stay the course with you tonight. So thank you very much for joining us Chris. I'd now like to introduce you to introduce yourself to our audience tonight and um, I have put your image over there for everyone to see and I'll now hand over to Chris to take us into augmented reality. Excellent, thank you very much Carol. Um, and yeah, it's, I really do thank you for uh, inviting me to speak tonight. So it's, it's, it's quite exciting. Augmented reality is something that I think is uh, going to be really exciting going into the next few years, hence why I've got a bit of an interest and a passion for that topic alongside everything else to do with mobile technology. Um, myself, uh, I'm not from a teaching background, just to give you a heads up. I'm actually from a, a technical background in both IT support um, and multimedia as well. Until I found out you know, about e-learning when I took on the role of e-learning services coordinator at West Coast Institute of Training and of course now I work for, well we did come under the umbrella of West One but now we're sector capability under the Department of Tra uh, Training and Workforce Development here in WA. Basically supporting e-learning take up um, uh, throughout the state um, as well as doing professional development workshops and everything from uh, learning management systems through to up and coming technologies, all that kind of thing. I'm just going to quickly post during my introduction actually three very important hyperlinks in the chat window there. One is our own PD website. Um, on there you'll find information about how to 
to attend our own um, professional development on e-learning. Some of that is online, some of it is face-to-face, -face. so for those of you in WA, obviously you're welcome to come along to those. Also, the National Vet e-learning strategy website, which is still flexiblelearning.net.au. My role is funded out of the National Vet e-learning strategy, so I'll probably get a slap over the wrist for not mentioning them in a session such as this, and I'll mention them several times, in fact. Um, and obviously the toolboxes from the National Vet e-learning strategy as well, a really good resource to go to for existing content if you're into that kind of thing, which saves a lot of time rather than do that than develop stuff yourself. Um, so like I said, more of a technical background, hence why I really do jump on board with things like uh, mobile devices um, and augmented reality and games and that kind of thing from a, a point of view of personal interest as well as my professional background. But now that I've really got into the e-learning niche, it really is exciting how these kind of things can really change the way we teach and change the way people learn. Um, and I really do think that's kind of opening doors to people that might otherwise shy away from the traditional educational methods um, and make things more engaging, more exciting, um, and hopefully get people more qualified, which at the end of the day is what it's about. Sometimes we get a bit frustrated with, well, how does this make my job as a lecturer easier? Oh, I hate to tell you that a lot of the time it doesn't. It's actually about making the student's life um, easier and better. So hopefully that falls on uh, friendly ears. Um, what I want to quickly go through today is basically a quick look at the mobile revolution, um, looking at how mobile technology is cha uh, changing uh, the, the training space as well as every other space. What are the key players in that mobile re re revolution? So what kind of, um, or for any years, excellent, glad to hear it. Uh, what kind of technologies within the mobile technology space are really going to shape things up and that are easy for us to get a grip, uh, get, get to grips with and use? And then obviously really unwrap what is augmented reality and it is one of the most exciting things, I think, in the mobile space. Before I go there, can I just uh, run a quick survey? It's really interesting data for us to gather, no matter how big or small a session, um, whether it's national or international. I just want to get a, a feel of what devices you guys are using. So I've just quickly put a poll up, um, and you should see the polling tool just above the participant window on the right hand, on the left hand side here. Sorry, you'll have to watch me with left and right, by the way, mix them up regularly. Um, so just let me know if your primary phone. You may have more than one, but if your primary phone is an iPhone, then hit A. If it's an Android, hit B. If it's a BlackBerry, C. Uh, Windows phone, D. And E for another. Maybe you've still just got a phone that's just a phone and has nice big bashy buttons um, and it isn't too confusing to use. I must confess, even though, even though I'm into this space and love gadgets and technology, when I first got an iPhone, it was like, oh, this is awesome. I can do all sorts of cool things. How do I make a phone call? <laughs> it was actually quite a frustrating experience until I found the big button that says phone or whatever it is. Cool. Okay, that's really good data for us. And what do we got? Oh, iPhone still winning in this one. Okay, but Android, look at that coming close. That really does show the space. Okay, another quick bit of information gathering for myself. Um, what about tablets? Who here has got a tablet? and what is running on that tablet device. So again, an A for iPad, which is the Apple device, B if it's an Android tablet, C if it's a Windows tablet. Anybody running Windows 8 here? Let me know in the chat window if you can figure out how to do that on a Windows 8 tablet. And D if it's something else, some China copy, maybe. I bought my wife a Windows 8 tablet for Christmas. I must confess I'm using her as a guinea pig. <laughs> it's a it's actually a touchscreen laptop uh, running Windows 8, and it's quite an interesting experience. I've been doing quite a lot of IT support since Christmas in the house, let me put it that way, but um, personally I'm excited about the Windows space. Oh, no Windows 8 users here though today. Um, look at that, lots of iPads. And funnily enough, I mean, I've got both devices here. I've got an Android tablet sitting in front of me, and I've also got an iPad, and it's the iPad I'll be demonstrating with today for several reasons, um, but yeah, really do. Um, feel the need to basically make things work and everything. Windows 8, excellent. Ian's using Windows 8. Thanks for that, Ian. Um, 
And yet, this is part of the changing space when we talk about mobile technology. So at the moment, everybody thinks it's a two-horse race. Windows 8, whilst I was a bit upset that they seem to have missed the boat, um, what they've come up with is, is actually quite impressive once you get your head around it. It's quite a big change from all of the other versions of Windows. Um, and what I think is going to really change in the mobile space are devices like this. So in the bottom left-hand, right-hand corner, told you, um, in the bottom right-hand corner there is uh, basically a touch screen laptop. In fact, that's the exact same one that I bought my wife. In fact, that is my wife's. Um, and so it's, it's just a laptop that happens to let you touch the screen. There's nothing more funky about it than that, uh, and that's quite cool. What we're looking at up here is basically what I would term a hybrid. So one minute it's, it's, it's a laptop and you can't touch the screen, but when you close the lid on this particular one, Funny enough, the back lights up and that's a tablet device and you use it like a tablet, so it really is the best of both worlds. That's the kind of thing I, uh, I see things going a little bit in the future. Give me a smiley face because sometimes is it just Chris going off on a bit of a, you know, think about what he thinks about the world and I'm actually getting it right. Can you give me a smiley face? Not just yet, I haven't asked the question, but that's all good. Good to know that everybody knows where the smiley face tool is. Um, but can you give me a smiley face if you've been using uh, an iPad or a Android tablet, even if it's got a keyboard dock, you find yourself at some point thinking, I wish it did what my PC does or I wish it did what my full computer does so that I can actually do some productive work. It goes so far, but not quite all the way. I'm seeing a few smiley faces. Yeah, and that's why I think I think Microsoft have, have, have been a bit dangerous in the change that they've made with Windows. I don't think it's quite what people are expecting. But if you get one that runs full Windows 8, then what you do end up with is a device that is a tablet and then jumps that extra mile and does everything that your your other laptop or your other PC does. The trade-off, I have to be honest, at the moment is battery life. These things don't last as long on, on a single battery charge as um, a standard tablet, an iPad, an Android tablet. So I'm not here to sell you Windows 8. It's just this is what I see um, the space kind of looking like. The reason why I really do like to consider that is because in my view, everything that we look at developing, if we're looking at developing it for educational purposes surely has to work on everything. So we have to see what's on the horizon. We have to understand, are our students using Apple devices, Android devices, Windows devices? Can we develop something that works on all of those? And if we can't, well, can we afford to provide that piece of equipment to our students? So if we're looking at developing an app, say, that only works on Apple devices, can we supply a classroom full of Apple devices so that nobody is disadvantaged? If not, then what are the alternatives? Can we develop for the platforms that the students are walking in the door with? Netbooks, netbooks are a very good solution, definitely. And again, that I mean, really, what I bought my wife was a touchscreen netbook. It's it's smaller than a laptop. The reason why I think that's important, if you look at the um, the WCAG two guidelines. And I might be a bit cheeky by, um, I don't think I'm trying to put a square peg in a round hole here. Guideline 4.1 says about maximizing compatibility with current and future user agents. Now, the mobile space is that big that surely that takes that into account. Um, is what we're developing compatible with anything a student is potentially walking in the door with? If not, surely that's an accessibility issue. And that becomes quite a nightmare if you're thinking about developing your own app. Hence, same as anything, same as developing something to put in your learning management system, surely the first thing to think about is, does it already exist? Is it already out there? So <laughs> hence this slide, do you develop or do you download? The first place to look is what's already out there. Um, and even with the augmented reality niche inside that space, um, I'm very pleased. Uh, one of the things I'll be showing you later, I was jumping up and down in the office. You can ask any of the people in the room. Um, what, what I was doing, but basically, well, I wasn't actually jumping up and down, but I was very excited. I found a really good educational augmented reality application. Um, last of the minute, I know, um, but I found that it was available on Android devices and Apple devices, and that really completed it. There was jumping, wasn't there, Yvette? Yvette works in the office with me. <laughs> Key part of our team, definitely worked very closely with Yvette. So yeah, there was actually physical jumping um, happening in the office when I found that. Things, you know, the, the the more devices it works on, the better it is. If you're interested in looking for existing apps, um, the, over in Queensland, they put together a very good document called Love Actually that lists a heap of um, 
documents that are really useful in the educational space. Um, so do take a look at that document. I believe that's been made into a live link on the slide there, so you can click on that if you want. If not, here it is in the chat window as well. Definitely worth looking at. Um, another, yes, there are apps, but one of the key things we're playing with at the moment is simply making um, web content accessible from mobile devices. And again, it comes under, if you're making a website or putting something up online, then it certainly comes under the WCAG 2 guidelines that you should be trying to hit. This is what that looks like. This is us testing one of the websites we were putting together for one of our face-to-face -face, um, uh, events, uh, the Emerging Technologies in Training event last year. And this is us testing it in several browsers on a desktop, also testing it on an iPad, on an Android tablet, an Android phone, and um, an iPhone. And of course now we would be jumping on board with the Windows 8 tablet and all that kind of thing to make sure it worked. Funny enough, all we were doing was using Moodle as the platform, but that in itself, we didn't want to take it for granted that it would work. We didn't have access to a version of Moodle that was mobile friendly, so we had to kind of use some, um, some intelligent design to make that work. So that really is a key thing to think about, I think. Here's if you're interested in looking at somebody else's journey as well. By the way, we're updating our own PD website, and um, we will be pushing out a link hopefully pretty soon. So you can actually read our developer's blog because our new website, again, we're going to basically list everything we've had to do to make it accessible and uh, mobile friendly as well. What we're looking at here is a successful project that came out of the National Vet eLearning Strategy funding. Um, and they did exactly that. Again, they hosted theirs in Moodle, but they simply used smart design to make a nice mobile friendly web page inside the Moodle course. And that linked to video. So one of the key things, uh, again, a key player within the mobile space is the use of video. That's going to really become prominent again, especially once we get high speed, you know, 4G and the MBNs rolled out and that kind of thing. My kids at home, they, teach, they want to learn a new skill, even uh, learn a new tune on the piano. They'll jump on YouTube, not on a PC, on their phone, so that they can put that on the piano and watch somebody play the tune whilst they're playing the same keys. And that's how, it, without any prompting from me as a techno geek, that's just what kids are into these days. QR codes. Give me a smiley face if you've used QR codes before or seen one of these funky little digital squares that you can see in the right hand side there. Okay. And if you've, uh, yep, Ian, you've, oh, I oh know, was that a clapping or is that a hand up, Ian? Have you got a question, Ian? Just let me know in the chat window or put your hand up again and I'll let you ask a question. That's cool. It may not have been a question. Um, if you happen to have uh, downloaded a QR code reader onto your mobile device for today's session, feel free to scan that code. It's not a video we put together, again, using somebody else's existing material. It'll, that will actually take you to a YouTube video showing you how to use a compactor. And as part of that video, it shows you all the PPE that you should be wearing and all that kind of thing. Uh, they're so easy to make. If you haven't done it before, QR codes can be made by going to many free websites. The one I use is QR Stuff at the moment. There was another one I used before that. And you simply put in the URL of what you want that QR code to link to, and it produces the graphic for you. And then you can use that in your slides like I have here. You can print it out as part of your handouts. So you can make it a sticker and stick it on a piece of equipment so that the students know how to use that piece of equipment safely. 101 uses of QR codes. They're really cool. The thing with um, QR codes, I would say, is always, always, always make sure your QR code links to something that's mobile friendly, otherwise you're kind of missing the point. Yes, you can scan one with a tablet, but most of the time it's a phone that people have got on them or in their pocket. So make sure it's mobile friendly content, otherwise, yeah, really a bit of a mess. Okay. Another one, I am getting on to augmented reality, I promise you, but these are all things I just wanted to slide in here as well. Ebooks. Again, dead easy to create an ebook um, using, so long as you lay out your Word document, that's a whole separate workshop, but as long as you lay out your Word document intelligently by using a free tool called um, Calibre, um, you can easily create an ebook in Mobi format for Kindles or EPUB for other devices and uh, all that kind of thing. And then, of course, you can go the step beyond and do things like the iBooks uh, with video in embedded and that kind of thing, but you do have to be aware that those kind of technologies will only work on the Apple devices. But really exciting space. Why? I mean, my kids have just started high school. 
for goodness sake, why are they having to take their bag every day that's overloaded with books and folders and everything when they could just be taking a Kindle loaded up with all their reading material for the year? Uh, I get a bit frustrated, um, but seriously, I'm not a greenie, but I think there are places where we can hug a tree and we don't have to print out an entire book. Um, and I think the ebook space, even if it's just an alternative to print, is one of the really sustainable technologies that are now cheaply available that we should really be making uh, use of. Ebooks rock, they certainly do. Um, give me a smiley face if you're using a Become a Greenie Chris. I am. Hug a tree. Stop strip mining. Oh no, wait. That keeps WA going. Um, now, uh, can you give me a smiley face if you're using a learning management system as part of your delivery, whether it's Blackboard or Moodle or something else? I don't really care what it is, as long as I can see that people are using them. Yep, good stuff. And again, the, the main players have really got hold of the need to make that space mobile friendly. Blackboard do it via an app, and this is what that looks like. And Moodle now, and thankfully we're at last on 2.3, so we can use mobile skins, and that's what we're using in our new website rendition. Um, and so Moodle is just, you can set up a mobile theme. Um, Woohoo, says it a bit. Um, and it, it really does help make that whole thing mobile friendly. Bit of tweaking, bit of coding involved, uh, depending on how far you want to go but it makes it a lot more friendly to use on a mobile device. So if you're using a learning management system, get your head around how to make that more effective on mobile as well. Here it is. Here's the big player of the day, augmented reality. Before we go any further, I'm going to pause, take a quick breath, and I'm just going to quickly turn on my video camera. Give me a smiley face when you can see that. You'll laugh at my video, my augmented reality um, <laughs> demonstration technology in use, there is a piece of software you can use to share anything that your iPad or iPhone is, is, is viewing called Air Server, and that would have been great to use, but it involves two pieces of technology. One is an up-to-date version of Windows, such as even something as old as Vista or Windows 7, and the other one is a wireless network. Hey, we have both neither here in the office. Isn't that great? Um, so what I'm actually using is I've got my iPad plugged into a, third, a, 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 a secondary monitor. Um, so that's my iPad is displaying directly onto a monitor. And then I've got my webcam pointed at that monitor. And so what you're seeing very indirectly is the feed from my iPad. And that's how I'm demonstrating this to you today. What you're looking at there is this little guy here. And you see, oh, look, I can go behind him with my water bottle and stuff like that. This is augmented reality. Um, and we're looking at basically what's called marker-based at the moment. I'll go into that more in a couple of slides time. There's several different versions of augmented reality. Um, he looks a bit bored, my friend, there. I'll make him walk around in a minute. Um, but basically, augmented reality is overlaying digital information over the real world. So yes, you guys are seeing my real desk here. Um, but you're also seeing this digital guy. He doesn't really exist, I'm sorry to say. I know there's kids watching, but I could easily kill him by simply blocking this marker here. Um, but thankfully, he comes right back again. Um, so I haven't permanently killed him. Oh, so it's OK, and he's OK. No, seriously, everybody, it's fine. Um, but he, he's a digital entity. He doesn't really exist in the physical world. But I've we've augmented him with the physical world that we all live in. And it's quite a convincing um, feeling. The kids in the room are probably going, yeah, I know, my DS does that. And that's it. The gaming uh, culture has caught up on this, and the Nintendo 3DS uses this exact same technology in some of its games. You place a little marker down on the table, and then using the, the uh, 3D cameras that are a part of the Nintendo 3DS, it actually picks up that marker and displays digital characters or the game world or whatever right there on the kitchen table or wherever you're, you're playing, or in their hand, exactly. Really cool stuff. And that makes it nice and interactive. This one's just a demo. He's not that interactive. If I touch my iPad, then I can make him walk around the desk. And you really do start to get the feeling that he's, he's part of our world and, and that kind of thing. Quite cool. Just think Terminator. <laughs> yes, nice. OK. Um, There's the, the several different types of augmented reality that I'm going to go through today. What we're looking at now is marker-based, um, and so that's cool. 
you'll see on my slide there geolocation. So that's basically taking your physical location on the planet via the device's GPS and overlaying the information that's relevant to that location. And there's also augmented reality which basically uses what you're doing with the device, how you're moving it around in your hands. Well, of course, you can all see my hands now. Um, so how you're moving your device around in your hands to make a change to that augmented um, object. Uh, and, and we'll have a look at all three of those types of augmented reality as we go through. The reason why, I'm just going to turn the video off. I don't want to bloat the size of the recording, but we'll come back to some more demonstrations. Um, this says it quite well. This is an excerpt from Professor Neil Selwyn, I believe that's his correct pronunciation, of Monash University. Uh, he's a futurist, um, and it's nice to know that somebody else is thinking the same way you are, because like I said before, it can sometimes feel like I'm just going off on my own crazy world. Haven't bothered to grow up yet, nearly 40, still play PlayStation. Um, but he's got some really interesting things to say, and you can see it there, overlaying the physical environment with digital information will also become big. Teachers could take kids into a digital forest where they can interact and get information about nature, blah, 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 blah. You can read the rest of that to yourself. Also, the really interesting one there is the, the, the bit about kids bringing their own tablets and devices. As I said earlier, how important is it that we make sure that what we're delivering works on everything, because otherwise we've got to supply an entire school or college with devices. Even in work these days, I'm sure most of you agree that you end up bringing your own device to work because you don't actually agree with maybe what IT is rolling out. And that's the way I think education is going to go as well. Like I said, my kids bought them the cheapest chips, Android phones, and that's what they'll ultimately, without being prompted, they'll use them, they'll find a YouTube video, they'll find an app, they'll do whatever it is that they need to do to practice a new skill or learn it or whatever. Wireless connection, definitely. You've jumped ahead to my summary slides, but totally. All this kind of stuff hinges on, obviously, the affordability of the technology, the content, and above all else, connectivity as well. Connectivity is going to be a really big driver. If you want to read more about that, again, there's the live link in the slide there, and I'll pop it in the chat window as well, depending on where you feel like clicking or which bit you're going to take home with you later. My workplace is difficult. Every workplace is difficult. I tell you, I've got no Wi-Fi here yet. I've got Wi-Fi at home. How can I? Back in the day, all the technology, all the coolest stuff was at work in the office because the company could afford it. And now it seems to be the opposite some of the times. All the cool stuff is at home where you've got the big TV and the wireless and blah, blah, blah. OK, marker-based. The way marker-based um, augmented reality works is basically um, exactly that. A marker will be printed uh, depending on how the application is developed. So if I just turn my camera back on again, um, if we ignore what that's looking at, I'm just going to plug put this in front of the um, the webcam here. So this piece of paper basically is the success of that particular app. Every time the app sees this marker, it goes, ah, oh, OK, that's where I need to put that little digital character. Okay, so if I that's the marker or the target as they're also known, and because I've made him walk about, he's going to be he's not exactly on the marker. But if I I'm just going to make him walk right back onto the marker. There we go. There he goes off onto the marker. Uh, he's not facing towards us, but I can now turn this round, and it's as if I'm actually physically turning him round, which is kind of cool. Um, the other thing I can do with a marker-based uh, piece of augmented reality is, and this is where it gets really cool, is at the moment I'm doing what augmented reality has done all along. It's, this isn't actually a new technology, and you used to be able to print out a marker like this and hold it up to a webcam running an augmented reality program on your PC and look at that object. But that is actually, funny enough, a bit clumsy, not really intuitive. And that was really the danger of augmented reality going out of existence before it even had chance to get traction. Because that's just not that's not really engaging or fun. It's great for 30 seconds, but then you get fed up of the paper folding and whatever. The way it works now, obviously, is this is a mobile device. So if I actually grab my iPad here, hopefully without knocking the webcam out of situ, then I can walk around this object. I'm probably going to strangle myself at some point in this session, by the way, just to warn you, with cables in the room. Um, but I could do something that's a lot more natural. Here's something on my desk, and I can physically walk around it and really take a look at what that digital object is. And so, that, so even marker-based, which is, like I said, it's not particularly a new technology anymore. Um, that's why that's starting to really gain traction, because the mobile device makes it more natural 
to do. Can I get a, um, <laughs> should we call him Gherkin? I think we should call him Gherkin. He is definitely a pickle with eyes. Can I get a smiley face if you downloaded the um, Augment app that we put out as part of the promo for this evening? Um, yeah, a few people downloaded that. And did you also print the marker? Give me another smiley face if you also printed the marker. Okay. Now I'm going to demonstrate it on the webcam as well for those of you if you haven't downloaded the app. But there is a cool app out called Augment. And uh, the website is there as well, Augment uh, Dev, uh, augmenteddev.com. And again, there was jumping when I found uh, this particular app. Where is the marker? Um, you can get it from the website. Um, but also I have it on the next slide as well. So if you want to interact in that way, you can just point the app at the screen when I bring up that slide and that will work as well. Now the reason why, because all this is well and good, I've showed you a little demo of a, of a gherkin walking around on my desk, but seriously, how on earth does that you know, relate to, to learning? It's all good fun, but unless you can actually create some of your own content or download a library of content, we're not really not hitting the mark in terms of making this useful for education. As soon as I found Augmentedev, I started to get excited because what Augmentedev, even within their free license, it lets you upload your own 3D models. Plus, that in itself is building a community of people uploading models. And funnily enough, every model that gets uploaded is freely available to everybody else. That starts to be really exciting. What I'm actually looking at on the slide here is a model I created years ago in a program called 3D Studio Max. I was able to upload that into Augmentedev um, and view it from my app. Um, so if you want to fire up the app now, um, and again, I'll turn on my webcam so that I can do it here as well. Just got to find my paper-based marker. So many markers here, you'd be surprised at what's going on. And I'm just going to fire up the app as well, so bear with me just a second. Come out of that one. Fire up Augment. If I knocked that webcam slightly, very slightly, it's probably livable. Okay. Later, I'll review you later. I'm reviewing you now to people in the session. Goodness sake. Right. And in Augmented Dev, what you can do is um, you can browse a library. Some of it is, um, you know, they've already put sections up, so you can browse by section. Um, or you can just go all models. And depending on how you're listing that, that might be alphabetical or it might be somebody's got a floating bubble. Awesome. Um, you can see here coming up on the screen, there's some quite nice, well, uh, made models. You'll find a lot of the time there are test models. People are obviously dipping their toes and maybe the texture maps don't work so that's the thing that makes it look like it's a brick wall or whatever. Um, and some of them you can have animations in these models and stuff like that. So sometimes you come across one that's clearly a test somebody's done and doesn't actually work too well. Um, but there are a lot of cool stuff there as well. But the, the best thing about this is the fact that if you set up your own account which is free, um, on their website, you can upload your own models. Now, I know everybody's not into 3D modeling, but that at least does open up to within your school or your college or your, your training organization. You can then, even if you have to get a subcontractor to say, hey, look, can you make us a 3D model of an engine? Can you make it as a 3D model of um, part of the body or whatever? And then upload those for your student to use, and it becomes a really cool resource. I'm just going to quickly uh, click on one that I know works. Okay, and there it is. Now, Augmented Dev, like I say, you can um, have animations within the model, so that would have to be pre-scripted in the 3D modeling tool before you uploaded it into their system. Um, but again, it's just really cool. You can uh, make things bigger and smaller, move them around. You can rotate them along different axes. So if you happen to have looked at one on the screen, so if you happen to have been using the, the screen marker, you might want to rotate it along the x-axis a few times until it looks like it's coming out of the screen, that kind of thing. And again, by doing a really natural movement, you can walk around and you can look at that object as if it was physically there in front of you. And think about distance learning now. Okay, let's say you're teaching automotive or something like that. Are you seriously going to ship an engine part to every single distance student? Or do you want to just upload a fairly accurate replica of that engine part, maybe with an animation showing how it works, and the students, doesn't matter where they are in the world, can simply print the marker, load the app, 
cert, uh, uh, bring up the model and they can be looking at it as if it's on the desk in front of them. Uh, the potential for this, now that it works with mobile devices, I think is really cool. Personally, I think the marker based is, is cool. It's not the coolest bit of augmented reality. Margaret Woodman did put a elephant on her computer. Yeah, it's true. It was the elephant in the room. I was there. I witnessed it. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. Marker based rocks. It does. Um, 3D modeling can be quite expensive, but if you've got a bit of uh, you know a technical background and, and you don't mind fiddling with things, Blender. This has been around for years. This is an open source 3D modeling tool, um, so that's definitely worth a look at as well. Um, 3D Studio Max, which is what I used to use, incredibly expensive piece of software, um, but Blender um, does pretty much everything 3D Studio Max does uh, for a, a lot less, in fact infinitely less, because it's 100% it's free. Um, so do check that out, or get somebody in your school or institute that knows 3D modeling to check it out. But using Blender, you could easily make your own 3D model um, and upload it into um, Augment. What I'm looking at here is, um, this is based on a story. Again, my kids, they come into everything. Uh, we went to this um, Astro Fest evening. In fact, bumped into a vet there as well. I have to be stalking each other out, out of work hours. Um, and it was a great evening and basically you know, lots of stuff um, about uh, um, astronomy and that kind of thing, funnily enough, as you'd expect. And they had several telescopes set up outside that people were queuing for to look at things. Now, we'd already queued up for one for, ooh, must have been at least five minutes. Oh, five minutes of my life, I'll never get back. And <laughs> that's right, I was talking to you about Um And this particular telescope that we'd already looked through was looking at the moon. Okay, and it was, it was quite a good look at the moon. And then, so a bit later, as the sun was going down a little bit further, uh, you think, yeah, I think it is the boom. Um, or is that about the stalking? Stop distracting me, guys. A little bit later, we're queuing again, and I noticed that one telescope is definitely looking at the moon, and the other telescope next to it is kind of, you have to have a keen eye, but definitely offset from the first one, definitely not looking at the same point of the sky um, as the first one. And so I looked up at the sky, and it was it was not as dark as this. This is a, this is a photo I've stolen off the inter interwebs. Um, but... Um, there was, but you could see the moon. Um, you could still see the blue in the sky, so it was just starting to get dark, but not actually dark. And you could see this incredibly bright star just offset from the moon, pretty much the same as you can see there. And I thought, okay, so I reckon that second telescope is looking at that. What, what actually is it looking at? So I whipped out my little cheap Android phone, because I'm a bit of a cheapskate with my personal devices, and I loaded up Google Sky Map. And I pointed my phone at the sky, and Google Sky Map said, that's not the moon, that's not a star, that's Jupiter, you idiot. Um, straight away, I'd augmented my reality. Now, Google Sky Map simply lets you see the map, but based on how you're holding the phone and your location on the planet, it will show you what you should be seeing in the night sky from that exact location. That's augmenting your actual position um, and your reality with digital information. Yep, my phone told me that. Not actually in those words, um, but the information I was seeing on the image told me that, and I probably call myself stupid, maybe. Um, on Apple devices, there's a really cool one called um, Skywalk, I think it is, and that actually lets you see the view through the camera and overlays digital stars over the top, and you click on the star and it will tell you about it. Really cool. Funnily enough, lots of people there, clearly interested in the stars and stuff, instantly crowding around this phone <laughs> and asking me, where did you get that and what app is it and can I download it for free and all that kind of thing. Um, the people that set up AstroFest hadn't told anybody about any of these apps. They were handing out these cardboard sky maps that you had to find north and match the date and the time and all this kind of thing. And here I was just running around with a cheap phone, giving a much better experience um, just by yeah using Google Sky Maps. That's really cool. Um, and this is another example of the same kind of technology. Anybody use Layer? Give me a smiley face if you've used Layer before. No smiley faces. Okay, uh, one. Okay. Layer is basically an augmented reality browser, so it's taking information based on what's been put into it and other sources. And again, as opposed to, think about something like Google Maps, 
It, Google Maps knows where you are, and if you ask Google Maps, um, you know, the direction to the train station, and then you tell it, do you want to walk there, blah, 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 then it can give you that information because it knows where you are on the planet, and it knows where the train station is, and then it can give you a map in between and give you, you know, overhead view, 3D view, satellite view, whatever you want. Augmented reality browsers work very similar. They need to know where you are on the planet, and they need to know where things are around you. But then they can give you this kind of view. So this is me looking out over the city of Perth from our fourth floor window using probably the most useful layer within the whole of the layer application, public toilet layer. That's right. By simply looking through the camera on your phone, you too can get a visual indication as to where the closest public toilet is for your convenience. Um, funnily enough, <laughs> this is probably the one actual um, example I have of me using augmented reality, apart from the star one, that's probably better now, but before the star one, um, lost in Fremantle one time, needed a public toilet, out came Leia, and thank you very much, there's one in about 200 meters. Great stuff. But that's not the only layer within layout, there's lots of layers, where are the restaurants, where are the bars, that kind of thing. Maybe not the kind of thing you want to be showing your students, but something like Wikitude, and I must be honest, I'm still in this one from Thomas Cochran. Um, he did a, a presentation at our Emerging Technologies and Training um, conference last year, and he brought up Wikitude. Very similar to Leia, but a lot more user-friendly, and the more I play with it, the more I like it. Same technology as Leia. What Wikitude does, though, is it lets you link it with things like Twitter and Facebook. So you can set up your own stuff, and you can you can set up your own space within Wikitude so that you pinpoint things that you're interested in, and you will always know where they are and, and, and how to get to them. You could also do that collaboratively. So you can set up a group of friends, and you can start marking things within the Wikitude world um, and helping them. But also there's heaps of different really useful layers within Wikitude, such as educational information, uh, sightseeing information, that kind of thing. So think of it, you know, if you're in a tourist hotspot, where are the uh, special things? If you're walking around a museum, you could mark each thing in the museum and send your, your, your students on a quest or that kind of thing. Really handy. And so um, this is um, a brilliant wiki. Uh, this is one of those, so this is me looking at the Perth Arena. That's the building you can see there. Interesting shape building. It knew that's where the Perth Arena was, although it thinks it's slightly over here, but we'll forgive it that because I was outside. And when I tapped on that, it brought up some more information and I could then read more, which would take me to a web page showing me more about that that uh, information. And because it's a wiki, it's called Wikitude for a reason, this is all editable by the general public so that you can add more things in and, and make it grow as time goes on. But all based on augmented. This is really the way augmented just at the minute information is going to go, especially, I don't know if you, uh, um, you might be aware, but Google are doing, they've got a prototype out of basically Google glasses. So think about a set of sunglasses which overlay digital information in your view based on what's happening and what you um, decide you want to find out about in the space that you're currently standing. It's, it's, it's really cool. Okay. Another one, <laughs> you're going to think I'm just getting paid to play games when I show you this next one. I kind of am, um, but there is a reason, and I will get to that reason. But there is, um, you can also do augmented reality um, that is just based on the accelerometer. So that's basically how you're holding the device and how you're tipping it um, around the place. And I'm just going to launch this app now. Let me just get my video camera up and running. Okay, and I'm just going to hold this up and uh, see where I'm going to face. Okay, and I'm going to. So at the moment you can see it's overlaying some digital information and um, it's looking through the camera of the device. I'm just going to quickly click launch, and what I end up with is this little radio-controlled spaceship that I can fly about. Now that's that seems very really simple. It's just you know it's just a silly little space game. But what makes this different and what makes this augmented is I'm not just controlling it on the screen and it happens to also be using the camera as a background. This thing is actually based on where I'm holding the device. So if I let this thing, I'm not very good at controlling it by the way, hence the flying around in circles. If I let this thing fly behind my head, funnily enough I've lost it and to find it I've got to physically swing around. So it's as if it was actually a real Reddit controlled toy, okay, and I'm having to move it around and I'm having to move around with it to keep track of it. And there you go, I've lost it, told you. This is why I don't have a real ready controlled airplane. They're quite expensive, and I'd have lost it a hundred times over and lost all my money. Um, 
Now, the reason why I like this showing this app, there's a good reason behind it, I promise you. It's not just so I can play games and get away with it. And I just need to get out of this. Okay. Okay. Bear with me a second. Right, okay. What I've done now is not crash the plane. Um, I've crashed the app. That's absolutely fine. Let me just go back into it. Because what you can do with gyroscope based is you could also make it so that you're in a completely different space. So if I say choose location here, at the moment it's showing my AR mode. And I can get it to show me a planet, a different planet surface. Okay, let me choose planet two. This will all make sense in a minute, I promise you. Okay. Now, if I launch the ship, forget the ship for a minute. Look at the background. I'm no longer seeing the view from the camera. What I'm seeing is a place that doesn't exist. And okay, so what? You can do that in 101 computer games or whatever. But what I'm doing is now is I'm going to physically turn around where I am and well, funnily enough, it looks like I'm now looking around a different planet. Okay, a light bulb starting to go on. I hope they are. Because I could potentially put a device in a student's hand and say, look, just find yourself a space, say seven meters by seven meters, with nothing for you to trip over, and run the app, not this app, I'm talking about an app that would have to be developed, run the app, and what you'll find yourself in is an automotive workshop with some OSH issues, and I want you to investigate the scene, have a look around the scene, and see if you can pinpoint what those OSH issues are and correctly identify them, fill out the uh, report, blah, blah, blah that kind of thing. And we're not that far away. This sounds all very sci-fi, I know, and probably expensive, um, but I don't think it needs to be. Let me quickly do an application share with you of a project that was done by Durac, again under National Vet E-Learning Strategy funding. Okay. Um, okay, and I think it's that one. Let's try that. Can you give me a smiley face when you see the web browser with the Durac thing in the middle? Excellent. Okay. So what I'm about to show you, this is basically, this is done by uh, Durac Institute, all with internal skills. And what they did was they made this um, virtual workshop um, for OHS units, so explaining PPE, things to look out for in a workshop and stuff like that. And they did it using 3D photography, uh, not 3D photography, sorry, 360 degree photography, all within the budget of the, of the project. And the students can navigate around it using their mouse, like I am here, and they could identify issues. When they set it up within their Moodle space, they could then fill out a hazard report and submit that. Um, but the simpler version, because it has to work in every single learning management system that they actually submitted to us, you can basically just hover over them and get information about that particular hazard. So you can really investigate the scene. And when you think you see something that looks like a hazard, you can investigate it some more, that kind of thing. They're so close. All that needs to happen is the graphics are already there. Um, in, in terms of 3D technology, what we're looking at here is what I would call an environment map. So using a 3D application, you simply tell it, this is what I want the view of the world to look like. So not even any 3D modeling is involved if you do this kind of thing. Throw that into an app that then uses the gyroscope control of a mobile device. And hey, presto, you would have exactly what I was just talking about when I was flying around Mars just now. So merging what we can currently do and what we can achieve and just going, look, it seriously is a couple more baby steps and we've got something so engaging and so cool that, you know, my goodness, what fun that would be. And what I'm learning whilst walking around in this virtual workshop, no, that can't be right. This seems too much like fun. That's the kind of thing that gets me going. I don't know if uh, that's coming across. Um, I've lost the ability to stop an application share. Bear with me one second. Stop sharing. There we go. There we go. And are we back at the slides? Give me a smiley face if we're back at the slides. Good stuff. So hopefully that started to, you know, put the two together. There we go, flying on Mars. Durac Automotive Workshop. 
One of the key um, bits of software I think that could be helpful to that, and I really am talking to any developers in the room right now, or at least if you know a developer or you have a development department or you want to find budget to outsource something, this would want to definitely be one of the key technologies to look at using. Pretty much a lot of the augmented reality demos that you'll come up across, you'll see the Unity 3D logo flash up. And a lot of the mobile games, um, if you've played any games at all on your mobile device, if it's anything with semi-decent 3D graphics, again, you'll probably find the Unity logo flash up. Unity is basically what we call an engine, a games engine. So that's a coding platform in the background that can run 3D graphics and games and that kind of thing. And if you, especially if you wanted to make something that's interactive, this is what you're going to be hinging towards. Unity is great because A, it's open source. Oh, does that mean free? Yes, kind of. Um, you can download the engine, and I've downloaded it at home onto my PC, and you can start playing away with it and seeing if you can figure out how to make it work for absolutely free. Um, you can also publish, I believe, to desktop applications. The way Unity works is it's, it's really cool because what you develop and output will work on PC, it'll work on Mac, and then what you can also do is publish to mobile devices. So you could use it to make an app for iPhone, uh, for iOS, for Android, for Windows, whatever. However, um, once you start going to the mobile platform deployment, that's when you do have to supply a license um, fee. So um, this is the kind of thing that you think, okay, does it exist already or do we want to develop it? If we want to develop it, let's look at using Unity 3D. We might need to outsource some skills if we don't have them in-house. We might need to look at the licensing cost. But this, just giving you a heads up, it's, it's not that hard. You just need to know what technologies you need to investigate and this is definitely one of them. I do, though, definitely lean towards always looking at what's already available. And this is where I want to quickly show you. This is a marker-based example. I mean, um, how am I going for time, by the way, Carol? I'm terrible at looking at time. So just give me a heads up in the chat window, if you could, while I load this last demonstration here. Um, but what I've found is an app called Anatomy 4D. OK. Um, and this is. Uh, marker based, thank you, eight minutes, that's cool. I think we'll be well within time. Mar and then that, that's good, leaves time for questions. This is a marker based example. Developing something, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not lying, I'm not going to lie to you, developing something is not going to be cheap. Bear with me just a second while I change it to the male model. There we go, okay. And all, always I say look um, to see if there's something that already exists because that's going to be a lot cheaper than developing something yourself. And what I found here is something that, you know, there's plenty of subjects that could make use of this. It's just, um, there we go. Okay. So this is a, basically looking at a marker based. And what we've got here is um, a, a model of the human body. And you can see here I've got several layers. So let's uh, just want to see the skeleton. I can turn off all the other layers. And I can just have a look at the skeletal structure of the human body. Um, let's say I want to see how the muscles fit in around that. There we go. There's the muscle tissue layer. Um, let's say, um, let's see where the, whereabouts do the lungs sit? Well, it's, it's respiratory. And there you go. Clearly, this is much better than a gherkin or a pickle. Oh, I've just knocked my cable out, so let's wait for that to come back up. Much better than a gherkin walking around. Hopefully what I've done now is contextualise what we're talking about here. This can actually be used, not just for Chris playing games and apparently counting it as work time, but this has some real potential in education. This app was free to download, and this is why I was jumping up and down in the office today, because it was available for iOS and for Android devices as well, and both work just as well. So I mean, that is is just so cool. Uh, and as time goes by, we'll see more and more existing content. And seriously, that's the best place to start. Don't reinvent the wheel. Is what I'm about to do for my students, is it already out there? Even if you have to buy it, that's going to be a lot more cost effective than, than doing it. It's actually called Anatomy 4D, uh, Frankie, uh, this particular app. So do a search on the Play Store or on the Apple Store. I haven't checked the Windows Store yet. Um, but yeah, it's out there, an Anatomy 4D, and that is awesome. 
Um, and again, I mean, the whole point is you can move around it in such a natural way um, rather than trying to fold a piece of paper up and hold it up to a webcam or play about with a plastic model or, or, or whatever. And again, distance, are you seriously going to, you know, put a plastic model in the post? Oh, and again, this one doesn't work without the marker, by the way. If you don't have a marker, as you can see here, you can simply rotate it by dragging your finger across the screen and do it that way as well. So that is cool. Okay. Unity 3D. So really to summarize, I think, um, you know, the mobile revolution is definitely is definitely here. It's not something we're looking forward to in the future. The key players, I think, in the mobile space are definitely QR codes, video, um, e-books, and that kind of thing. But also, clearly, augmented reality is going to be a big part of the mobile thing. It's not it's not the future. It seriously is present day and the very near future. I do really believe it's achievable. You just need to know where to start looking. Um, but just like anything else, the success or failure is going to hinge on the quality of the content. A gherkin on a desk is not educational content. It's just fun. So we need to figure out how to actually make it relevant. And connectivity is also a big player. Although some of these apps, once you've downloaded it, that anatomy app, you don't have to be connected to use the app. Okay. Things like Augment, yes you do though, although you can download the models directly to the device. So that's all I have um, to present to you. So I really do just want to open up the floor to questions. I'll turn off my microphone and have a bit of a swig of water, I think. Boy, oh boy, you need something stronger there, Chris. Please take your time now. That was absolutely fantastic. I was gobsmacked if we still use that word. Uh, if, when you get a chance, you can look back through the uh, text chat for all the wonderful comments that were coming through. We were having such a lot of fun and so much multitasking happening. I want all those who are multitasking to find a way to capture what they were doing, at least in words, if not in pictures, and add it as comments. Now, let's see if we've got some questions. I know that uh, there was one or two uh, way back in the, um, text chat and Marlene was saying uh, perhaps tongue-in-cheek uh, 4D so perhaps it does some time travel there and uh, talking about the um, the model of the human there and if there's any other questions now's your chance come on over click on the talk button and go for it All right, three second rule, gathering your questions, your comments. Don't be shy. Come on in. Tell us what you thought about it. It was fantastic. I've been a little bit busy Facebooking and tweeting, uh, but um, we have a guy in our institute here in northwest New South Wales called Dave Gilchrist, uh, who's a fabulous um, forward thinker with uh, technology and I was, well like a thing tonight with Chris that you reminded me of, of uh, Dave who, who always makes me think, oh my god, I better go and learn about that. Uh, I've learned about QR codes, I've learned about augmented reality and I think this is amazing. It was an incredible session. Thanks everyone. Well that's what we needed to hear. Thanks Judy. We certainly engage with you. It was fast paced and it was uh, deep and it was light and uh, very entertaining. So Chris, have you got any final words for us? Perhaps some advice? Um, no, I think in terms of advice, I think just jump on it. Um, it's so easy to be scared off by, oh yeah, but what if we don't get funding? What if we can't achieve it? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, I've read several times recently from different sources, you know, the fact that if you never make a mistake, then you just aren't, simply aren't trying. Um, you know, and that's the case. D dabbling about with technology like this, it's not going to be easy. Um, and, you know, there are going to be mistakes and fumbles along the way, but my goodness, how exciting can the output be if we eventually get there? And we will get there. It's like I said, uh, it's using existing technologies and simply taking a few baby steps forward. So don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid to bang on the right people's doors for funding and that kind of thing as well. Um, and let's get out there and do it, definitely. Thanks, Chris. That's really good advice, actually. If folks want to contact you, are you happy for them to have your 
email address. If you'd like to pop that into the text chat, that would be awesome. I'm just going to flick through to our next session so that uh, we can tell you what's coming up for e-talking. We've wowed you with augmented reality. Now we are going to enthrall you with crowdsourcing. And Anne, would you like to mention a little bit about what's going to happen on the 13th of March? Over to you. I think Anne is texting in there. Uh, we are definitely having Megan Lemmer. I'm not sure if I've spelled her name right there, Anne, so correct me if I'm wrong. And the crowdsourcing is all about the power of networked or the global brain where everyone's knowledge is pulled together. And Anne has uh, all, already been using that particular strategy. I think Anne's got some problems with her internet connectivity, I see red around the microphone. So uh, I'll move on now and say thank you to our presenter tonight. And uh, let's give Chris a round of applause, the usual Illuminate way, using the little icon in the participants area there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not the hand raiser, it's the one underneath the smiley. You can find it, it's just called applause. Hey, <laughs> good stuff. It was a really fabulous session and we thoroughly enjoyed bringing to you for tonight, Chris Winter. Thanks again. And join us whenever you can on our Facebook group or on our Google community. Those links are not live so you'll need to search for us. They're both open groups.